Hello my bookish friends, welcome or welcome back. I am Elizabeth, this is Reading Riley, and today we're going to talk about all of the books that I read in July of 2023. This is a wrap up. I'm excited to tell you that I read some amazing books in July, and so though there are only eight of them, I shouldn't even say that. You know what? I'm proud of that number because July is crazy for me in this house because we have Hadley for the entire month. It's madness. It's chaos. Full-time parents, I have so much respect. Anyway, five of the books that I read out of those eight are four stars and higher. So we've got some awesome books to talk about today. Let's get into it. As usual, I'm going to start from my lowest rated to my highest rated of the month. I'll separate this down in the chapters below so it's easier for you to navigate through. That's it. Let's talk. The first book that I want to discuss was actually the Midnight Society Book Club pick, which means that my pick was the lowest I rated this month. But you know what? We're up against some very fierce competition here, so I don't even think that's that bad. I gave it three stars, and that is The Odds by Jeff Strand. Um, I do have the live show discussion about this. There's non-spoiler and spoilery sections in there. If you want to rewatch it, feel free to get a very in-depth idea of what we felt about this. But what this is about is we're following this man, Ethan. He is on a work trip in Las Vegas, and he's got a gambling problem. He didn't necessarily have to take this work trip, but he did. And he finds himself, what do you know, in the casino, and he's losing money and losing money and trying to win it back and then losing more. The cycle of gambling has caught him in a very bad place. So he is trying to figure out how he's going to tell his wife and children about this, about how he lost like nine grand of their money. This guy approaches him, Rick, and tells him, hey, you look suicidal. You might be up to play a game. <laughs> and this game that he offers him, he tells him there are many challenges. He can stop whenever he wants. The first challenge, he has 99% odds of winning $10,000 and 1% odds of having his left arm smashed to pieces. He goes for it. And there's a lot, like when we talked about this, we talked a lot about like, would you, would you? And we had some, I think I was actually the odd man out for, <laughs> for a lot of that. If I was in his position, I would never get myself in that position. But if I was, I think I'd do it too. And that's just being real. This is very plot focused, not so much character focused. There's just a lot going on. The games continue. Let's just say that. It's kind of a fun, fast pace. I think I called it a popcorn thriller or popcorn horror. It's not heavy on the horror elements. If anything, I wanted this to be, have a little bit more body, um, body horror in there, but it was not. And so I thought it was fine. I think it was a fun, fast paced thriller. I would definitely recommend this if you're interested. The next book I want to talk to you about, I gave 3.5 stars. It could have gone so much higher than that. I didn't love how it ended. That is Night Will Find You by Julia Heberlin. Now, here's the thing. This book, do you ever read a description for a book and you're like, yes, and they say one word and then another word and you're like, okay, yes, 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 check, check, check. It like checked all of my boxes. And so I immediately had to read this. This is set in Texas, in DFW no less. Texas is its own character in this. It has a romance subplot, but it is a thriller. It talks about astrophysics and also intuition because our main character is a psychic crime solver. Okay, there's a podcast element. There is talk of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Marfa Texas and Big Bend. And there's a mystery underlying all of it. Like all of these things, when I heard this, I was like, okay, I have to read this immediately. And I ended up really enjoying this. I will 100% read from this author again. I think maybe there were just one too many elements that were trying to go together for this one. And the ending felt like a romance, more of a romance to me. So I do think though, if you are a romance reader and you're looking to delve into thrillers, that this would be a perfect place to start because you definitely get those elements of a thriller, but you also have that underlying subplot with the romance and all of that. 
Did I even tell you what it's about? I, I don't know. Vivi is a psychic, uh, reluctant psychic. She doesn't necessarily even believe she has powers, but she has done things that seemed miraculous in the past. When she was in middle school, I think, there was this boy, she kept having a dream that he was gonna get hit by a blue horse and he was like, okay, whatever. And then that kid then gets hit by a blue Mustang convertible. From that day forward, he is devoted to her. <laughs> um, he becomes the sheriff, I think, of this town. There's this other kind of like, greasy cop character that's like clearly the bad boy and there's this underlying mystery of a missing girl if that sounds good to you then read it okay this next one i honestly have no idea how to talk to you about this like i don't know how to explain it i don't know how to explain my thoughts on it i honestly don't even know how i feel about it i think it was a little bit over my head and that is a short stay in hell by stephen l peck this is a novella so very very short little read and very existential and philosophical it just feels like it fits in right here because I have not rated this and I don't know if I'm going to, to be honest, because it's baffling to me. It's an anomaly. So we're following this, this Mormon man, Soren Johansson, and he is a geologist and he dies. So at the beginning uh, of the story, this is not a spoiler, he's dead. He has always believed that when he dies, he's going to be reunited with his family in this eternal hereafter. And he finds that that is not the case. He's greeted by a demon I think they call it and this demon's like hey guys this is what's going on here's what you're doing you're not going to heaven you're going to hell but it's not the hell you think it is tell us on this whole deal about how the the one true religion everyone was wrong it's this 10 thousand year old ancient religion that I've never heard of. Their hell is not eternal. They have to go to hell in order to face challenges to get to heaven. Anyway, his hell is this library that never ends, a la The Midnight Society by Matt Haig. No. Nope. That is my book club, a la The Midnight Library. Thank you. His challenge in this afterlife is to find the book that accurately depicts his entire life, word for word, grammatically correct and everything. And the thing is though, that all of these books in here contain everybody's story ever and every character or letter ever written. And so it's all encompassing and all random. And so just to get find a book that even has one lucid sentence in it is remarkable. And so when he gets there, he thinks, I'm gonna find my book and go home, but that's not necessarily the case. And we go through this whole like world of his, this hell that I guess is hell to other people too, or maybe they're not even real. It just makes you think about like everything in life. Um, there's a lot about math in there and trying to understand the end of infinity. How far will that go? Because everything seems so pointless. Like there is no point. They're looking for meaning in everything. I think that's a reflection of human beings in general and how we are trying to find meaning in our own lives. Um, so if that made sense and you are interested in that, then read this story. I still, I'm like, it hurts. It hurts to think about it. Moving on. The next story that I want to talk about is The Only One Left by Riley Sager. This is the new Riley Sager and I feel like all of booktube read this book in July. I just had to jump on the bandwagon. You know, last year when Riley Sager's last book came out, I read it the day it came out and I was so disappointed. And so I've, I said to myself, I am not gonna go out of my way to read this one on release day this year. It's if it happens, it happens. And I got it from my library, so it happened. I read it and I'm happy that I did. I actually really enjoyed this one. And I think that is a pretty popular opinion from what I've been seeing anyway. There is a spider crawling up my wall. I'm just gonna let it be. So in this story, we're following two female lead characters, Lenora Hope, as well as Kit. Lenora is this old woman. She's living in this decrepit mansion that is literally like hanging on the edge of a cliff. And she was accused of murdering her entire family when she was just a teenager. She now has medical disabilities and she cannot move any part of her body except for her hand. So the only way that she is able to communicate is through subtle taps or we come to find out writing on a typewriter. She meets Kit who is going to be her caretaker. Kit also has her own kind of 
tragic history. She it works for this company and the last person that she took care of, she left some pills out and they overdosed and died. And so the company that she's working for had suspended her, but they let her back on because they couldn't prove that she killed this woman on purpose or helped her kill herself. And so they stick her with Lenora Hope because nobody else wants Lenora. She's a murderer. <laughs> like, why are they gonna? No, no thanks. Lenora one day types down on this typewriter, Kit, I want to tell you everything. And she's thinking, I'm gonna get the goods. I want to know. The way the story is written is we have Kit's perspective in present time. And then we have Lenora's written typed out messages interspersed as she's telling her story. What to say? It was fast paced. There are so many twists. It makes your head hurt when you're thinking about I still don't know all the answers. Like I honestly still don't quite understand. After reading it, after researching it, after watching Gabby's live show, like I still am like, mm, I don't know if that totally fits, but I'm not going to use the, the brain power to figure it out, you know. <laughs> but here's what I'm learning about Riley Sager is I cannot take it too seriously. And because when I do, I'm disappointed. It's Riley Sager is not for or the reader that is looking for something moving or something with a, a lot of discussion or intent other than what is on the page. This is a straightforward, but not, thriller. Fast, beach read thriller. Doesn't have a whole lot of meaning. You want to escape your daily life and you get sucked into a story and you want to be shocked pick up a Riley Sager. That's what he does. So that being said, he did it again. This is that. And I had a good time with it. Let's move on. My last four star book, and I think now I like the more I think about this one, it may be a five star as well, to be honest. After this, we have all five stars. And that is Cutting Teeth by Chandler Baker. I just ordered the hardcover copy because I did enjoy it so much um, after listening to the audiobook. This is Chandler Baker's new release. She wrote The Husbands that I loved at the beginning of the year. This is for anybody that wants to read about the intricacies of motherhood. Explore that through the lens of kind of a dark thriller. I think what I do love about this is it does that thing where it takes this figurative idea of mothers being sucked dry by their children and turns it into something literal and real. And by doing so, it's shining a light on the real life horror that is motherhood. Not to say that motherhood is some terrible thing. Obviously, there are other aspects, but the part that we don't often investigate or look at with more depth is the part that's hard and the part that sucks. And this one, the story really explores that. So we're following these three moms and they're all like their little mom friend group. We get each of their perspective along the way. Darby, I'd say, was the main character and she is just worn out. She's exhausted. All of their children are four years old. They go to the Little Academy preschool. The children have picked up this odd medical condition, this very rare medical condition where they are actually craving blood. And so this turns this Little Academy preschool you know, on its head because first of all, they're judging each other so hard that they're not even gonna admit whose child wants blood and whose child doesn't. Then the preschool teacher, their beloved preschool teacher is found dead. The only potential witnesses to this crime and potential suspects are these four-year-old little gap tooth kids who are just like, Mommy, I'm hungry. There's a satire in this that I really enjoyed and it's got like a dark humor to it. I love how Chandler, Chandler Baker ends her books too because she, I feel like I relate to her in the sense that like we both enjoy a little bit of a not like this didn't go over the way we thought it would. <laughs> so yeah, I feel like this is not, you know, if you're thinking little kid, you read the description and you say, hey, little kids that are basically vampires, horror, don't go into it for that because that is more of just a framework to this. This is not like a zombie book in, or anything like that, a vampire book or anything like that. It is a different kind of horror. It's a horror that has more commentary within it than a straightforward like, you know, whatever that means, you know, slasher or something like that. Okay, we have three more books and they are all five stars. It was such a good month. The first one is 
not going to be for everybody, but for the ones who will enjoy this, you're going to love this. That is Our Wives Under the Sea. I was very kindly gifted this by my lovely friend Meg. So thank you so much like a year ago and I still hadn't read it. I feel like such an asshole, but I got the, the UK version of this cover. <laughs> so beautiful. So beautiful. What is this about? Um, this is by Julia Armfield. I don't know if I said that. She is an incredible, beautiful writer. This is definitely on the purple side, but it's so rich and thick with atmosphere and visuals and feeling. I don't know how to explain it. The writing is so languid and pretty. It's cursive. You know, it's like if you spoke it, it would you'd speak in cursive. I know I'm not making sense. We're following this couple, Mary and Leah. Leah is a marine biologist or something similar, and she is sent on this mission in a submarine below the ocean. Um, first of all, also having read this after the whole submarine debacle happened, I could not help but think that Julia Armfield did better research than the people that built the sub. There's a lot to learn in here about submarines, so if you just want to learn about that too, you can... You can catch this. Yeah, so Leah is meant to go on this three week trip and it ends up being gone for six months. It's about loss and grief. That's what this story is about. I don't know what, I don't know how to explain things. Words, make the words work. Yeah, Leah comes back, she is not the same at all and Miri is afraid she is losing her. We hear a lot from Miri's perspective while Leah's gone, though we do get some bits of Leah's perspective while she's down in the submarine as we go. So we learn like what actually happened to her down there. There are some amazing little bits of body horror in here as well, which I loved. There's this one thing scene where they talk about an article that they're reading where a woman has accidentally grown squid inside of her mouth and birthed them. Um, so stuff like that, which kind of reminded me of like Eric LaRocca's writing. And because this is about kind of the loss of love and the horror of grief, I would say it also does remind me of Ian Reed because it's very psychological. I read a bunch of reviews that said this had an open ending and I felt like it was pretty clear to me, but maybe that's just me. So if you don't like an open ending, then maybe you won't like this. But I do think that if you like weird stuff with beautiful writing, you should 100% pick this up. It's gorgeous, gorgeous. Like the way this cover too, like the drips of water, that's the writing as well. It's not just the cover and it's perfection. So good. Okay, the next five star read that I want to talk to you about is Mary and Awakening of Terror by Nat Cassidy. This is a bit, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be, this book, this paperback. Um, it was a little bit of a longer story and a bit of a slow burn. So keep that in mind. This is not one to read for the twists, but this is one to read for the journey. We're following Mary and Mary is going through perimenopause and she's just very meek and small and quiet and she lets herself get walked all over her entire life i don't think she's ever stood up for herself she lives in new york city in this tiny apartment she has no friends she gets fired from her job she's trying to figure out what the hell she's gonna do when she gets a phone call from her aunt was it aunt i think her aunt who raised her after both of her parents died when she was a child in the middle of the desert and she hasn't spoken to her in years her her aunt needs help she is elderly, she's still living in the desert, and she can't do it alone. So she tells Mary to um, come help her. <laughs> her aunt is quite the character as well. She's crass and loud, and she has a little tiny chihuahua named Chipotle, who she, she calls Chipotle, and um, she's funny too. This story is about finding yourself. It's about claiming your ethereal as well as your corporeal being in the world and realizing that you have influence no matter who you are you have influence on the people around you i just related to her inner monologue so much 
because I felt that way, not now, but I, in, at a point in my life I did feel that way. Like I couldn't talk to people because I, what if someone doesn't like me? And you know, these kind of like toxic thoughts, uh, I totally related to that. There's a forward and an afterward by Nat Cassidy and I loved both of those as well. I felt like I got to know him as well. And he kind of says, hey, I know I'm a man writing this story, but I've had this story within me for years and years and years and I have to get it out. He talks about how when he was a kid, his mom was a big fan of horror stories and he was scared shitless of Carrie. And so he, his idea for this book was what if Carrie was not supernatural? What if Carrie was just a regular person and didn't have telekinesis? How would she grow up to be? And that is Mary. And it's perfection. It's perfection. I love the idea. The way that he writes is so thoughtful. It's shocking that it's written by a man because he's so in tune with the female experience that, you know, I, I have nothing negative to say about that. And his writing just takes you there. It's so atmospheric. If you were a fan of Sundial by Katrina Ward, I think you're going to love this uh, desert setting with its community of really weird people. This does go into, it goes into some wild stuff. Like I say that Mary's not supernatural, but there is still some some of that mixed in here. And you know what? I didn't even mind. It all made sense. Mary has a really bad memory. <laughs> a lot of the stuff that happened when she was a kid growing up in this place, she does not remember. But now that she's going through menopause, she's going through all these weird things and she doesn't know, like people keep telling her classic textbook menopause. But she's like, I don't think so because she starts seeing things, specters of the past of these women with pillowcases over their heads and they're bloody and she realizes that it's connected to the serial killer of the past that was from this town as well. I hope I gave you enough information to pique your interest about this one because it's just so beautifully done. I loved the supernatural elements in this which is rare for me. I thought it was dark in the best way. It was challenging. Every little thing that happens with Mary is interesting but it but it goes in a direction you may not expect. <laughs> Can't wait for the next one. This is his debut. Came out last year this time. Uh, Nat Cassidy, highly recommend. The last book that I want to talk to you about that I read in July, my favorite book of the month, is Far and Beyond Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent. Uh, my first Liz Nugent never read from this author before and I hope her other books are just as good as this one because I can't wait to devour them. Um, give me recommendations down below if you know this author because I honestly like never like I'd heard the name before but just like kind of on my periphery never really like heard anything that intrigued me enough to pick up one of her books and then this one. Someone recommended this to me. Thank you so much. In this story we're following Sally. Sally is 100% neurodivergent. She is, um, she's had a traumatic childhood and she gets adopted by the psychiatrist when she's like seven years old. She doesn't remember anything before that, like nothing. She's a bit of a recluse. She lives with her father. She's now in her 40s. We're following her in a first person perspective, but then we're switching perspectives to this kid named Peter. We don't know how they're connected at first. Her father passes and he had told her in passing, when I die, he had been sick. He said, when I die, put me out with the rubbish. She said, okay. And so she did. She put him in the incinerator in their, on their farm. The town folk found, find out about this and she becomes headline news. They're like, uh, what? She's the whole time not understanding what she did wrong. She's having to live on her own and she's trying to navigate the world. And then she gets this letter from somebody calling her Mary. And her father also left her letters and told her not to open them until a week has passed between each of them because he didn't want to overwhelm her. But she has her past is connected to something very messed up. Her birth father was a terrible monster. There are some aspects of genealogy in here of Sally confronting who she is, what makes her who she is. This has a unique tone for a thriller because it does have those, that kind of fast paced and twisty plot, but also this, the darkness of this, it's, it's focusing on the fact that monsters are real people. And so that kind of holds it down to earth in a way that is more sinister, in my opinion. 
It talks about genealogy and the inheritance of darkness. The most poignant moment in this for me, I think, was this moment where it shows a victim turning into a predator and that kind of cycle and how that comes to be, how our trauma affects us as we grow and how it can overcome us unless we overcome it and unless we work to to change and to be better. Um, and so I fucking, I love that. And it also does not have like a happily ever after ending. It felt true to life in the horrors of life. And I loved this. I loved Sally Diamond. She is a great character. And all of the character work in this is top notch as well. This is, I think it's set in Ireland. Oh my gosh, is it set in Ireland? I think it is. The audio narrator has a very thick accent, but I loved it. And so that is it. If you have not um, heard of this or checked this out, oh my gosh, read it. It's so freaking good. The audiobook's fantastic. Cannot say enough. This is probably going to be on my list at the end of the year. I love this. And maybe some of these others as well, if I'm being honest. Those are all of the books that I read in the month of July. Thank you so much for hanging out with me while I appreciate you so much. If you watched this to the end, why don't you give me a diamond for Sally Diamond? Also, in the month of August, we are reading for the Midnight Society Book Club, Camp Damascus by Chuck Tingle. Check out my Instagram, my book club Instagram for the details and I will get to you shortly with the date of the live show on that. And I think that's gonna be it for me. Don't forget that life is short, so read Riley. Cheers and goodbye!